So thanks everyone for, for joining us. This is, a, I guess, a bit of a showcase and an information session on some of the amazing facilities um, that we have at AMF and, and TRICEP. So we'll go through three presentations, overviews of the different facilities, and then you'll get a chance to do one-on-one -on -one Zoom um, or direct Zoom chats with the, with the experts. And you can talk about your project and um, if you've got specific uh, inquiries about how you can use the facilities for your project. So we'll post those Zoom links in the, in the chat. But stay in the main meeting for the three presentations and then we'll close this main meeting and, and go to the different Zoom rooms. All right. So first up, uh, we'll go in the order of speakers in the order that, that came around in the, in the flyer, which is Peter first and then Sanjeev and then, and then Stephen. So um, Peter is going to talk to us about um, the AMF materials node first. Peter, do you want to share your slides? Will do. And you've got the presentation, I think? Yep, that's perfect. Yep. Awesome. All right. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thanks. All right. So I'll try and make this short and sweet. Um, so the AMF materials node um, actually has two university members. It's got uh, University of Wollongong here and also at the University of Newcastle, um, which is part of the Centre for, Org, uh, for Organic Electronics. Uh, what I'll do is I'll actually try and give you a background on, on the funding mechanism, which is this NCRIS National Research Infrastructure for Australia and how it underpins the activities that we're doing. And um, I guess why it is important for everyone to say thank you to NCRIS and AMP and all their work and how it supported ACES going forwards. So NCRIS is um, it's a national capability. It funds um, big sites and national infrastructure across Australia. And the budget's quite significant. Um, I think in the last round, it was about $150 million. Sorry, $1.5 billion over 10 years is, is the current appropriation, which equates to about $150 million a year um, across um, significant projects, and I think here it's 1.9 over 12 years. Um, but it's been going uh, for quite a long time. There was in 2016 a National Research Infrastructure Roadmap put out where uh, researchers like ourselves could uh, recommend investments in supporting Australian science. Um, there is a new roadmap about to be released. In fact, there's a questionnaire out there at the moment where you can have your input into these activities. Um, and that would be for the next investment, uh, which would be likely five years for salaries of people like um, AMF and also another three to four years of equipment funding. And a lot of what Sandy and Steve will be talking to you about afterwards, we based on uh, some of the capabilities that we can deliver under that um, infrastructure that's been funded. So. Uh, AMF has been running since 2004. I think we've been active at Wollongong definitely since 2005, 2006. Um, it's about 3.3 billion being spent over that period. So a really significant investment in world-class science. Um, and part of that is also there's co-investment. So state governments and universities that has actually thrown in a significant amount of cash into that. So at present there's 22 projects nationally under NCRIS. Um, and if you went to the NCRIS website, you could Google and find out what those projects are. And one of those is AMF. AMF is one of the flagship ones. Um, and it's highly networked and you can read all these stats here. But again, it's also highly leveraged. There's definitely for every dollar the carbon Commonwealth puts in it, it sees another about a dollar, twenty dollar thirty in investment. So it's, it's a quite well funded system. So under the NCRIS program comes AMF. Um, so it's, a, it's an independent not-for-profit company established under NCRIS and it's for the nano and microfabrication R&D industry or community. It originally started out being uh, very university focused and it's evolved into something far more and um, is looking to, I guess, expand more into uh, commercialization and translation of our science. So the areas of specialization the materials node, I like to think we sit down here, and we're the ugly duckling of uh, AMP, where we are very much polymer and materials based um, and in organic electronic devices. So it fits very nicely and says supported very well 
the AMF materials, oh, sorry, the ACES community over the past um, 17 years of, uh, that we've been around for. There are other AMF nodes. Optofab is very much dedicated towards laser uh, patterning, laser cutting. WA is uh, micro MEMS and semiconductor uh, detection systems, it does a lot of defense work. New South Wales node, which includes the Sydney University and New South Wales, is very much focused on um, quantum computing. Uh, AMP Victoria, which is headquartered out of the MCM, but it's also very distributed, much distributed across other universities within Victoria, is uh, very broad in terms of what it does. Um, it does lithography, nanostructures, nanobio, does a range of things. Similarly, Queensland um, supports the state of Queensland. South Australia is very, very much into microfluidics and surface patterning. So if you have an interest in microfluidic device uh, development, these are the guys to go to see. And ACT is very much into photonic type uh, semiconductor devices. Um, so really in the state of New South Wales, there's the materials node, the New South Wales node, and the OptoFab node um, are the main players. So we sit in there and I reckon suggest that you all go and have a look at our website. It's actually very good. Sam has done a brilliant job on developing that website, um, which is listed here. And you can see a range of um, facilities and more videos, which will be on top of what Sandy and Steve will talk about. But as I mentioned, Materials Node is based at Wollongong and also at the University of Newcastle. Um, and it combines uh, TRICEP, um, as an initiative for um, bioprinting. It has supported uh, ACES COE and um, spawned out of IPRI. And it also forms a part of um, Newcastle's Centre for Organic Electronics. And we have, as you know, offer a range of um, capabilities. So uh, from biomaterials, fibres, um, advanced structures, uh, 3D bioprinting and Sanjeev and Steve will talk uh, a bit about that. Um, material synthesis, could be they graphene or conducting polymers, we have provided large amounts of those materials. Um, particularly Gelma, if you've been using Gelma, the chances are that Gelma has come from the materials node and you should be saying in your publications an acknowledgement to the end materials node for that wherever possible. So Steve will talk very much about the 3D printing aspects and some of the new tools that we've got online. And there are some fairly significant investments coming online soon. The AMF materials node, or the AMF itself has invested approximately $4 million in equipment over the next or last four years, um, ending in June next year. Um, and there are some really significant capabilities coming online in addition to what I'll be talking about briefly here. And potentially Steve and Sandy will touch upon those. So what we have is a range of um, equipment that's available for everybody to access. Now, um, up to date, most of the access to AMP has been covered through an ACES subscription. And so it's been fairly transparent um, and you haven't ever seen the bill for usage now with ACEs coming to an end, um, that's going to have to change. And if you, to start using this, you need to consider how we're going to access and how you're going to support paying um, access to it. So there is, rather than going through this list, you can download this later on. This presentation will be open to everyone, I presume. Um, so you can have a look at the, the list of 3D printing capabilities, which Steve will touch upon and some very significant characterization tool. Now, one of the strengths of AMF in general is the fact that it's under supported, not only it's the equipment that's available, it pays for staff. And so at Wollongong, there is quite a substantial number of staff who are directly employed um, as a result of the AMF materials node. So in 2007, which is when we basically kicked off at Wollongong, we were three full-time equivalent staff, and uh, we're now up to about 16 full-time equivalent staff appointments and ideally growing. Uh, we have a, a new position about to start very soon 
in the area of quality management systems and that person will help us take our biomaterials and convert them into um, a standard which is compliant for medical grade devices. So there's lots of work going on here. If you're using the equipment that I've listed and all work with these people, again, in your publications, you should be saying thank you in our materials note. It costs you nothing, but it makes our funders very, very happy. Um, the AMF materials note at Newcastle is, is a very different beast to us um, at Wollongong. Wollongong, we're very much focused in 3D printing 3D biofab and materials development. Um, our Newcastle node is very much into polymer electronics, but printed polymer electronics. And uh, that's headed by Paul Dastor and um, a person called Ben Vaughan, Dr. Ben Vaughan. Um, and they do very large scale real to real printing. So um, there's a niche here of 100 square meters of APB that was placed on a building um, owned by Shep. And that uh, is, sorry, I'll draw it. Oops. Um, and quite a significant output. So, if you have any interest in printed polymer electronic devices, they have uh, fairly extensive real to real printing capabilities and will very soon be um, getting a, a full vacuum coating for our web printing system. Um, to start scaling up these sorts of uh, technologies. So if you have any interest in that, come and have a chat with me afterwards. At Newcastle, it's a very small team, much smaller team. There's only five people directly involved in supporting those activities. Um, but still, it's quite a big investment in terms of Australian science. So what has AMP actually done and how does it work? So every time somebody does something, we go and count what you've done. Each of these 355 unique, are unique people. They are users, and uh, I can name every one of the, these users, and whenever something material is sent to you, or you book to use equipment, um, you're registered, and we track your usage. Um, so there's 355 unique users back in 2020. We're about to do that census again at the end of the financial year. So these numbers, it'll be interesting to see how that's fared with COVID. But over 41,000 uh, hours in usage, um, which entails about 16,000, 16, 7, instances of interactions, whether that's using equipment or receiving a widget from us, a 3D printed object or a biolink or whatever. As a litmus test, that's about 1,600, um, 116 hours per user, um, or about two, two hours per user per week, um, which basically says everyone at some point in a week would have used an AMP service, be it an individual supporting a project from AMP or some equipment, which we've tracked um, through our booking system on ACLS. Um, and that's actually, it's very potent and it makes us one of the more successful nodes across all of the network. More importantly, of those user hours, more than half are external to UAW and about 30% of them, 35% of that is actually industry hours, um, which is a, a major goal for us to um, target. Uh, finally, Tricep. Um, was spawned um, off the back of AMP and ACES. Um, and it's a, a substantial facility which is aimed at um, uh, cellular engineering, bioprinting of biomaterials. Um, and it's growing its customer base. Many of you have actually purchased uh, Gelma um, from um, AMP. Some have been supplied by materials by AMF um, under the ACES agreement. Um, so uh, there's opportunities there to expand. If there's particular specific buyings that you're very interested in, um, you should talk to Sanji um, and we'll see what we can do. Um, 
There's also a very potent group of um, 3D printers there, some highly skilled individuals and really cutting edge 3D printing um, facilities, which I'm sure Steve will touch on. So how to access, you can talk to Gordon or you can give me a call. Um, you can uh, have a look at the uh, AMF website that I, the Materials Node website that I showed. AMF has a website that's not so good. I think Materials Node is much better. Funding, okay. Um, ACES is finishing, as we all know, it's coming to an end, unfortunately. So if to engage with the AMF and for AMF to continue to engage with you, we need to uh, have services covered. Um, AMF gives the node about 1.2 million a year. Um, for operational funds, but that's still not enough to maintain the significant number of people and the equipment to facilitate new. So the charges to access the facilities are quite modest and you can even um, defray those costs by taking up a subscription, which makes it even more cheaper. Um, so when you think about putting in ARC grants or any grants, remember to request from those grants access to the AMP network, whether it be here at Wollongong or Newcastle or anywhere else across Australia. And that's where I'll leave it. And I think Steve will be following up with some of his fancy 3D printing capabilities. How's him tricep supported by AMP? Yeah, he will. Thanks very much, Peter. That's very impressive. Um, we're going to hear from Sanjeev next, I think, and then yep. um, Steve. Oh, yeah. keep, keep building the anticipation. <laughs> Sanjeev, you. are you are you ready for uh, yep. the presentation? Yep. Uh, can you see my slides? In a, in a minute. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Thanks for the introduction uh, as well in between. Um, I, so uh, what we have been doing here at Tricep, we actually are supporting the clinical needs uh, and also setting up uh, scalable opportunities to uh, interact more closely within an industry here at Tricep. Tricep is uh, is ANFF funded world class facility, and if you look at it's uh, in very close proximity to uh, the main institute. Uh, Australian Institute of Innovative Materials, only five minutes walk. And we have an excess of all the equipments and facility, what Peter just mentioned in the equipments. Do, uh, though we have dedicated equipments here at Tricep, but uh, very wide range of equipments are easily accessible for detailed characterization of uh, the bio inks, which I will be talking of. So what we have been doing here at Tricep, uh, starting from uh, creating a concept of biofactory extracting the biomaterials modifying formulate and uh, do the stability study the sterilization packaging and dispatch everything we have been uh, doing here at tricep and uh, we are documenting all the processes and as the new person responsible for implementing we will be uh, soon acquiring the iso uh, accreditation for the facility. So which is very important when we are talking of creating the implants for uh, uh, clinical applications. So if we look at the uh, publication, there is an increase uh, in publications over the uh, last six years. The trend is uh, continuously increasing. And uh, this is the trend we, uh, which we observed for the bio inks. And under the bio inks, if we look at uh, uh, mainly collagen, gelatin, gel mass, silk, chitosan, hyaluronic acid, and cellulose and all genetic. These are the biomaterials which have been used and 90% of the biomaterials uh, reported uses these bio inks. And uh, interestingly, 90 uh, um, uh, more using gelatin and gel ma. So I will just touch base and here at Tricep, I would like to mention we have been using all these biomaterials for press processing the bio inks. I will touch base on the uh, gelatin and gelma, what we have been doing here. Uh, otherwise it will become too long. Uh, 
so these biomaterials as such cannot be used uh, in most of the cases for customized applications. So starting uh, with uh, these biomaterials, either we are putting uh, different degree of functionalization photo cross linkable groups, or uh, we are creating some functionalities to attach to the peptides uh, in case of polysaccharides. So all these modified materials we are using for different applications for cartilage repair, eyelid cell, cornea repair and uh, neural repair and uh, very widely for wound healing applications, which I will touch base here. So uh, when we are talking of uh, the, uh, modification of gelma, we are putting uh, different degree of functionalization uh, using the methacolate groups on gelatin. So as we increase the degree of functionalization, the rheological properties does change. Uh, the, uh, the rheology drops as we increase the degree of functionalization, as you can see uh, from 84% uh, to uh, going to 37%, the viscosity does change. And we can tune the re uh, rheology depending on its customized application. Here at Tricep, uh, we have been working with end users to provide them the materials, which is very uh, specific for their application. Uh, as uh, I have been showing here, my uh, colleague, uh, Stephen Byrne, who will talk about uh, this customized uh, biopen, excel a biopen for directly uh, 3D printing into the defect side using the coaxial uh, printer. So for this particular application, we wanted to have a, a bio ink which has the desired viscosity and also photo cross linking during the 3D printing and uh, meet with the mechanical properties. So if you look at the diameter of internal diameter, which will contain the cells as well, and the uh, shell will have uh, the biopolymer, it material has to pass through 500 microns and uh, outer uh, shell of around uh, 1000 microns. The so material needs to have continuous uh, uniform viscosity. At Tricep, we have got dedicated multigram facility and we have automation during uh, the reaction and also in process quality control during the processing. We have uh, characterization uh, tools which are required immediately to monitor the quality here in tricep and also during the process process we are completely removing the impurities and filtering it the material through membranes during the entire process of purification which then meets with the requirement to flow during uh, the excelta biopen printing which i just showed uh, using the coaxial printing we have been uh, uh, at uh, tricep interacting with uh, um, Melbourne researchers to provide them the materials which they can use for uh, cell expansion and also uh, 3D printing. It needs to meet with the high quality uh, purity requirements which we have been processing here at Tricep for expansion and finally uh, for the bioprinting. So uh, uh, Dr. Afsane Kansari, who is uh, ANFF staff responsible for developing the testing procedure, very similar uh, how this materials is eventually going to be used by the clinicians at the final stage. Uh, so we are trying to develop the similar uh, conditions of characterization here at Tricep. As you can see, uh, as we are increasing the degree of functionalization, the photoreology uh, and storage modulus is continuously increasing. And um, we can tune the mechanical properties by uh, changing the degree of functionalization. Uh, softer material uh, with low degree of functionalization, whereas uh, with the higher degree of functionalization, we can uh, get stiffer materials depending on the uh, end user's requirement. So uh, we have been working very closely uh, with the uh, end users, uh, Professor Peter Chung and uh, Associate Professor Claudia De Bella at St. Vincent Hospital, who is using here, as you can see, uh, the uh, biopen, which um, my colleague Steve, uh, Stephen Byrne has developed here and doing the trials on the animals. These uh, trials under advanced stage of commercialization with improved bio inks and uh, later stage, we have improved the uh, printing uh, process uh, as well. So it is very paramount, uh, like you know, to talk about the quality of the starting material. Uh, here, uh, I am sharing the slide where there is a uh, uh, number of publications, but 
in these publications 90 percent of the pub, uh, publications are using the materials source from the secondary sources like sigma or rich or alchemy but only five percent of the end users are using uh, sorry publications are using materials from the primary sources whereas we know all these biomaterials are species specific and it is very important to fully characterize the starting material and uh, uh, as I mentioned, 5% uh, publications are not reporting at all from where they have sourced the material. So, uh, as I mentioned, it is very important to establish the quality uh, what, for the materials that we have been using. We have been uh, working with the um, uh, manufacturers here, uh, Venus Shell, from where we have been sourcing and also we are going to increase our sourcing and in, uh, inventory of biomaterials uh, like alginate and cryotogen we are developing with them to source in future. So at TRICEP we have been uh, uh, engaged in uh, doing the sterilization of Sonic Ansari and Kalani Revaru. They have been uh, scaling up the sterilization um, uh, protocols here at following the same procedure what was developed by Kahal and we published a paper uh, standard techniques of sterilization are autoclave filtration solvent treatment uh, ethanol and chloroform uh, depending on the application we are optimizing which conditions to be used for the sterilization and also as these materials are going for implants we are uh, now um, going to test endotoxin units in our final products and uh, along with the bacterial challenges what uh, we have at this stage for the bio inks. So uh, shelf life as uh, it is important, we are doing the uh, real time stability study of all these bio inks and optimizing what are the best conditions for the storage and the packaging material. And uh, it may depends uh, depending on whether the product is stored before or after sterilization. So everything we have been studying over a period of three years uh, for these uh, materials. We are interacting very closely with the industry. And as you can see, we are uh, uh, working with Inventia for uh, providing them the materials uh, manufactured under certain quality regulations and also interacting with uh, world leader, um, uh, Professor Fiona Wood for uh, um, uh, developing these bio wings for wound healing application. So uh, uh, we have been supplying as a starter pack with uh, uh, every ready, which um, um, uh, my colleague Steve will be uh, supplying and it will contain the protocol of the uh, 3D printing and also consumables of the printer. But I would like to mention here that uh, this starter kit is not limited to only these bioings. We can supply different grades of gelma, uh, hyaluronic acid methacolate, ol one methacolate, alginate methacolate, different degree of functionalization and alginate RGD functionalized uh, with uh, any peptide. Um, and also if you uh, anyone has got customized requirement of the bioing, we can process and also provide uh, scale up the process uh, of that bio ink. So I will just uh, end up here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Just um, if you have any questions, we can talk about it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sanjeev. That's very impressive. Um, I think we'll move on to Stephen and then we'll open up the individual um, Zoom meeting so everyone can talk to Stephen and Peter um, individually. Yeah. Sorry, Jenny, that should be okay now, is that it? Yep, that looks perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, thanks, you. And um, okay, so I'm just going to give an overview of some of the additive fabrication and biofabrication capabilities that we have here that have been funded through the Anth Materials Node, and some of those uh, facilities are housed uh, within Tricep. So here's a, an overview of what Pete described as a very nice and extensive suite of additive fabrication tools. Unfortunately, this isn't completely encompassing. There are other tools within the, the facility, but just to give you a, an idea of the capabilities that we have. We have a range of FDM technologies, both in carbon fiber reinforced nylon and a recent investment in the Stratasys F370 system that allows us to a range of thermoplastics. We have a range of inkjet printing technologies, re most recently including Mamaki system that allows for full color representation of printed components. 
And then we move into some of the higher end systems where we look at um, a number of metal systems that we have in house, a concept laser, uh, MLAB 200 or as well as a recent addition, the Trump TruePrint 1000, which replaces the aging Realizer SLN50 that much of our earlier work was done on. And then very recently, we've expanded into ceramics uh, using a little Serifab system that we've recently acquired from Austria. And we're going through uh, quite a, a steep learning curve with this system um, and is pretty much uh, an example of installing uh, high-end technology during the time of COVID, uh, necessitating the need to employ third-party installation uh, partners and um, having them approved through the actual original company. So that's been quite an interesting exercise in itself. Within AMP, we also have a range of bespoke and flagship uh, bioprinting systems. These include the likes of the, the Envision Tech Bioplotter as well as the GSIM bio scaffolding system, and then some lower level machines. Um, and obviously the ideal within ASIS and a lot of the community is to look at developing multi-material integrated printed structures that would incorporate both structural elements as well as bioactives and in some cases uh, the inclusion of soft conductors and a range of other functionality within a printed structure. So you can appreciate that that would require multiple materials being printed simultaneously over different length scales and with different levels of control. So we started out in this area a large number of years ago by adapting some um, three axis positioning systems to allow us to extrusion print uh, polycarpolactone, modifying that system to allow us to incorporate other functionalities such as UV curing of tough hydrogel materials, looking at different deposition techniques such as inkjet printing to allow us a finer control, almost drop on demand control where we could distribute cells within printed structures and the disparity and the differences between these printing technologies and how we can integrate them in together and what printing resolution is actually required for some of the applications that we're looking in. Quite often we'd find that um, when we purchase equipment that it wouldn't be completely fit for purpose and especially with the likes of some of the materials that we're developing where we want to have temperature control over those materials as we're depositing them instead of trying to elevate the temperature to melt a thermoplast, we might want to reduce the temperature to have finer control over the viscosity of a material. Or indeed, if we want to have different substrate materials, so instead of extruding onto a flat planar sheet or a glass slide or any other um, Petri dish type arrangement, we could then extrusion print onto fourth axis, so rotating mandrels that would allow us to print circular type objects. And we've done that quite successfully with a range of different systems. But then we want to look at how we can change the morphology of the materials as we're depositing them. So instead of just depositing one single material, we have had the need to be able to deposit multiple materials simultaneously. And this is the kind of coaxial head configuration that Sanjeev has just referred to. Uh, earliest examples of this is when we started modifying hardware to allow us to incorporate 3D printed coaxial head systems. First off, um, trying melt polymer systems going to higher temperature melt polymer systems where we're using actual commercial PLAs and a range of other polymers, and then applying that idea to the delivery of hydrogel materials. And this is the example case of the BioPen, which has been developed over a number of iterations over a number of years um, with a whole workflow incorporating engineering design, feedback from the, the end users who are the clinicians who are uh, defining the actual technology need and then getting that system through to preclinical trials as it is at present. But often we find that the clinician will want to use a handheld device because they want the freedom to control the structure as they're depositing it. But the vast majority of the time, we want to be able to have finer control over these systems as we're depositing uh, materials into structures so that we can do controlled a multi-series test. So this is an example case of a system referred to as the 3D ALEC, which would allow us to cost-effectively deposit up to three materials simultaneously into a structure. And the example case here is for printing ears, where we would have polycarpolactone as a reinforcement structure, a, a scaffold, a, a, a sacrificial scaffold material uh, deposited typically underneath the PCL, and then within the pores of the PCL, we're depositing cell laden materials. So as you can see on the right hand side, there's three distinct ink reservoirs, three distinct cartridges, each have fine control over the positioning of those materials, and then allowing us to produce a multi-material, multi-layer structure. 
But uh, learnings from that have led to the Treaty Ready platform. The Treaty Ready platform has been developed specifically for research and education in the area of biofabrication, taking our learnings from multiple material deposition uh, and packaging that into a cost effective and easily accessible platform that can be used both as a training tool and to expand on research practice. So the system moves away from the typical pneumatic extruders that are used uh, generally in the industry, allowing us to go towards geared stepper motor drives. This allows very fine volumetric control of materials as they're being extruded. And in this configuration, when we've got two materials, it allows us to vary the ratio of the two materials as they're being extruded simultaneously through one of our coaxial extrusion nozzles. Uh, the system typically uses 3C syringe carriers, although we can adapt that and uh, work with lower volume syringes. So we can work between three and one CC syringes, allowing you to have fine control over the materials in reservoirs that are kept between 10 and 40 degrees. So if you want to reduce the temperature to uh, manipulate the viscosity of a fluid or elevate the temperature of a fluid so you can sustain cells uh, in a printing environment. The system is based around a four or five nanometer LED. This can be swapped out for different um, UV or, or um, light wavelengths. The other feature of this system is that we have variable intensity on the UV uh, on the blue light source. So allowing you to have variable cross-linking density throughout the printed structure, allowing you to affect the modulus of those printed materials. As Sanjeev has shown you a very nice cross section, you see the coaxial extrusion nozzle there that allows us to have, uh, to affect the morphology of the materials. So we've got an inner core typically containing a uh, material of primary interest and then outer protective sheeting. And all of these materials are then able to be extruded onto a range of different substrate retaining bases, uh, which are easily modifiable and adaptable for specific needs. In its um, present configuration or in the configuration I provide there, this system has been set up for nine hours of practical sessions that are delivered with the system to train users in the basic knowledge of the system and then how to exploit some of the capabilities. But I'll go through those a little later. Uh, obviously, we've got additional functionality in these printers. We then have to have the user interface to allow us to access that functionality. And a lot of work is going on here in developing a refined user interfaces that will allow us to have very fine control over the materials as it's being deposited, but also allowing users to uh, interact with the software very easily to maximize their success in using it. So the practical sessions, um, first session focuses on taking the printer out of the box, setting it up, understanding the functionality of the printer, calibrating it, and getting used to the adaptable software. In the second session, staff and students are able to practice printing with a single material by then varying printing parameters, see how that has affected the printing characteristics of the materials and on, onto a specific substrate, optimizing those printing characteristics, and then um, determining if they have selected, uh, successfully optimized printing parameters. In the third practical session, we then start using the coaxial extrusion nozzle and exploring how changing the cross-linking density affects the printed gel on materials um, and allowing you to vary that cross-linking density and visually infer how you've changed the modulus of the material. The systems are now being deployed globally. We have a number of systems deployed here in Australia as well with partner organizations overseas uh, and that is expanding at a pretty interesting rate. And hopefully by the end of the year, we will have deployed up to 50 of those units to our partner researchers as using those as a means of education, as an alternative to flagship bioprinting platforms. So with that, thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions in the breakout session. Thanks, Aaron.